Hey friend, welcome to the Grief to Great Day podcast. Do you feel like you're going crazy? Is the shower the only place for you to really cry? Are you surrounded by people, but you still feel all alone? Do you want to be the you you were before your loved one died, but you have no idea how to get there? I'm Steph Cabanis, Southern by choice, wife, turtle triathlete, Jesus follower, and fellow traveler in the journey of grief. I too struggled to breathe, questioned God and my faith, and thought I would never be happy again. But God took my brokenness and he turned it into a breakthrough. So if you're ready to understand how to navigate grief, lean into your faith, and take just one step towards healing, then bring your ugly cry, get into a comfortable place, even if that's your bed right now, and let the healing begin. Girl there's hope for your future. Valeria Holloway has been in the counseling field for over 20 years and established El Shaddai Mentoring. She has a master's degree in clinical Christian counseling and has been a minister at Quinonia Christian Center in Greenville for 20 years. Valeria has been employed at Vidant Inpatient Hospice for over 17 years as a chaplain. And her philosophy is, if I can help someone to cope, have hope, smile, that my living will not be in vain. On a personal note, I'm honored to call Valeria a friend. Now, I didn't meet her at the inpatient hospice house where Monica was a patient, but I met her afterwards at Koinonia Church. Now, we can certainly cut up, but what I love most about Valeria is her heart for God and others and how she lives out her faith. So I I do want to thank you for taking your time to come on to the podcast and to share not just your experience and expertise, but also your heart for a subject that people don't usually like to talk about, but there's such a need for it. So thank you for coming on on a Saturday morning. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I do want to bring out a little bit about um, the time that we went to that spiritual retreat. Yes. And which was an incredible experience. And I would highly recommend people getting away just to be with God because life is so busy exactly. um, and go with people that, you know, you trust on a faith level and also yes. friends because mm-hmm. we had the best time just getting there. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> we got there. That's it. And I we think were able to say anything to each other. Right. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I have never seen like we were three women in a car and it it could have been dangerous because we were laughing so hard and you were like oh my stomach oh my stomach (laughs) (laughs) exactly it was so it's good good. for the heart it's you know actually in the bible it makes yes yes definitely and yes I think we were we were praising God in that way for sure yes Mm -hmm. exactly Uh, so appreciate you coming right. on. Thank you. Hello, everyone. This is Valeria Holloway. I am a chaplain at Vidant Medical Center, and I've been there for about 20 years, loving what I do, loving helping people. Um, sometimes if you can just say a couple of words, it doesn't have to be a whole lot, but the fact that you're engaged and that you really care about people and that they are just not an inconvenience to you. So that's why I love doing what I do. And I just just love people. I stay busy at church and I'm taking care of my 84 year old mother. And I have experienced several deaths in my life. So it's not like you're in this field by yourself, though we all have different angles that we come from you know, being able to talk to someone that has gone through, though I don't know your feelings, but the grief, the anticipatory, the cumulative loss, the complex grief, it kind of all goes in a ball together. So one of the things I wanted to just talk about is the feelings, Um, because we have our feelings, but in a nutshell, society really, they tell us to kind of suppress them, which is not good. 
So that's why I am here to let you know it's okay to feel what you need to feel, when you need to feel it, and how you need to feel it. And not have to apologize for your grief or feeling the loss of your loved one. One of the things I wanted to say too, um, the factor in, you know, including some of the grief process is it deals with our personality, you know, the survivor's personality, um, the coping skills, um, different patterns. Um, sometimes a person may have some substance abuse, you know, then it goes down to how was your relationship with your loved one? Some people had a fantastic relationship. Some people did not. So, and then it comes down to um, your spiritual beliefs and the type of death. You know, I often wonder working in the inpatient hospice, you meet so many people because in actuality, we go through 20 to 35 deaths a month. And then I just wonder, because some people tend to just do pretty good. And, you know, they mention we're going to be okay. This is what he wants. And then some people, they just feel like they want to just jump off the edge of the earth. But I always want to talk to both individuals. And it goes back to the relationship and it goes back to how you're coping. And one thing that we have to recognize is that you never get over it. And I think what society says in conjunction with our feelings, they really want you to just get over your feelings at a quick pace. But I wanted to tell you it's different with different individuals. No one ever gets over the grief. It can last for years. Um, one of the aspects of going through grief, you have the cycle, you have the stages, you have um, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, which she brought her elements out over 30 or 40 years ago. Now things are changing from the cycle to your individual pathway because you have your own particular pathway. I have my own particular pathway, but it's mine. And it's not for the world to understand. And again, it goes back to your personality. My son is probably one of my best examples because when he lost his father a couple of years ago, he, of course, helped plan the funeral and he did a lot of things to keep things going. But in essence, he just went through the grief process really at a point where it's like, are you okay? He says, I'm fine. And I don't think I've ever seen him cry. Not that he had to cry. I've never seen him really get angry or questioning God. So I don't know if he went from the first stage to the last stage all within a week or whatever. But it goes back to his relationship with his father. They were not always really close. Now, however, I think he's going to be more affected with me and his grandmother because he's really close to us. And by him being an introvert, and that goes back to our feelings and how should we feel. He doesn't want a lot of the fluff fluff. If you just say, how are you doing, Marquis? He's just fine. But if you start getting too mushy with him, he's going to shut you down because of simple fact of his personality. And then you have the extroverts. They want all the attention. Keep talking to me 24 hours a day. That's how the extroverts normally run their pattern. But in hindsight, can anyone keep someone going for 24 hours a day? It is really, really difficult. So just know the, the different personalities. One of the things um, Steffi and I would talk about from time to time about life and how society as a whole, we are a death denying society. We know that it's here. We know that things happen. We know that grandma, granddad, coworkers, people that are close to you, you, your friends, they, they all die. But for the most part, we try to get through it really quickly. 
But if we go back to our nursery rhymes 40, 50 years ago, some of them that was written, um, and it was a wake up call for me. And I know this may seem a little, a little humorous, but it does make me laugh um, because one of the famous nursery rhymes um, books is, you know, Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men, they could not put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And I was a little upset because I said, okay, Humpty Dumpty died. They could not put him back together again. So that was the loss. Nowhere in the book did it say he was put back together. So it was a loss, but who dealt with it? We just went on to the next nursery rhyme. And then we have our pets, even if it's a fish, they die and we just go right on through life with it. But the feelings are the same, whether it's a fish, your cat, dog, you know, your life, some people lose a limb, some people lose their leg, some people's children have gone off to college, but you still feel the same. You still hurt, you still miss that individual. So I just want to validate your feelings and express to you, feel what you need to feel. By me being a chaplain, I have to bring up a little Bible from time to time. And even when I talk to families, at the inpatient hospice, you have some families that, okay, they begin to apologize. They say, I'm, o- I'm, I'm okay, I'm sorry for crying, I'm sorry for crying. And I never shut the tears down. As a matter of fact, I never give tissue too quickly because it's one of those subliminal messages as, okay, dry the tears up at a quick pace. But if the family member is not ready to, you need to just let them cry it's hard for us to just be so that that's the thing we just let the families do what they need to do feel what they need to feel and tell them that they do not have to apologize and then Jesus is almighty all powerful but not only did Jesus cry he wept he wept over his friend Lazarus So that lets you know he had his moments that he cried. So why can't we cry? Why do we have to shut him down and go on to the next event? Only in society where they try to push us through that. So I just wanted to um, to let you know here, just talking to people as a whole, and you realize that there are several different types of people in your life when you go through grief. And it's called the good intentions of others. So, and this may hit one or two of you all, it's three sets of people, the people that avoid you, then you have the advisors, and then you have the advocates. So the people that avoid you, they don't know what to say. They just don't know what to say. When I lost my father, some of my close girlfriends, it's like, still, I have not heard from them because they didn't know what to say. So they just shed everything down. So, but that doesn't mean that I wasn't feeling upset with them because to me, you could have picked up the phone and called and see how I was doing. So, you know what? They didn't say anything. They looked the other way. And then when a couple of them did come around, they talked about the weather, work, anything but the death. The bottom line is that they just didn't know what to say. And my mind continues to work all the time. I think about the most inexpensive way that I can help someone. Okay, we have the dollar store. You can always go by and get a card, even a dollar card. And it just says, I'm thinking about you. So I was thinking along those terms, but I had to keep moving on. And then you have the advisors. Those are the ones that are in and out of all our lives. To be honest with you, they kind of get on your nerves. They are the ones that think they have an answer for everything. We call it artificial constellation. And we can also call it platitudes. And you heard statements like this. Hey, just move on. God knows best. Well, the ones that the chaplains have to spiritually untangle, God just needed another angel in his garden in heaven. 
So now we have to talk to the families and say that God didn't take your loved one. So because that previous statement, they begin to get upset with God. Why did he have to take my loved one? Couldn't he have taken someone else? So it's that theological twist. Maybe God needed another flower. No, God doesn't need another flower in his garden. The fact is, life is life and it happens. And he gives us a way to cope with it. They say things like cheer up or favorite one. I know exactly how you feel, but do we? Do we know exactly how someone feels? I could have lost my father. You could have lost your father, but our relationships are totally different. Or I can imagine how you're feeling or some of the things they say, I'm always here for you. Call me if you need anything. I like to go a step further because the average person that had a loss in their life, very few of them are going to call you and say, hey, I need something. We can always suggest, can I bring something over? Can I bring um, some food from the store? Um, can I come by and mow your grass? Just call it and just checking on them. It's always something we could do. But the average person says, call me if I can do anything. Or I never forget when I lost my child 30 years ago. And though my son is 30 now, I never, well, I, I got pregnant afterwards. I never forget what my aunt said. And I was just coming out of the operation room. And the first thing she said is, oh, you can have another one. And it just did something to me because you didn't even give me time to grieve, not even five minutes. After coming out of the surgery, you say, oh, you can have another one. Like I am supposed to suppress and not feel anything. But again, that's what society does. You know, we say things, at least he wasn't in pain. All his pain is over. But these are things that the family really don't want to hear at that point. Some of the things we can say, you know, when versus at least his suffering is over, we could say, I know you will never for forget your loved one or tell me about your loved one. A lot of times people will begin to reminisce about the death. So just keep in mind when you have the advisors, they think they know everything. And sometimes we wonder, should we say something to them? Because sometimes we're just too angry to say something or it may come out the wrong way. But sometimes you have to address it and say, you know what, that's not what I need to hear right now. And maybe they need to get some education from somewhere, because if not, they will continue to say things like that. And we call those the advisors, because they just say things that, for the most part, don't make any sense because it appeases them. And of course, my favorite, these are the advocates. These are the friends that just are there for you. They offer practical, hands-on entities like helping you clean your house, bringing you a meal, sitting with your children. And they would just hold the conversation. They would just let you talk, which is hard for our society because everything goes 24 hours a day. And we feel like we have to keep talking. But the best thing is to be there. And it is an art just being present because you feel like we have to keep talking but if you're right there and if they want to talk then you talk but the art of silent presence is an art so I just wanted to just kind of just let you know just a couple of things like that and just let you know that you're not on this road by yourself and be able to express your feelings now on the other hand Though grief goes through stages and it's your individual pathway, people can't stay, your, your friends and families and co-workers and people at church, your community can't stay in the grief spectrum long. They can't deal with the, the crying all the time because they are, it makes them feel uncomfortable for number one. And sometimes they don't know what to do and they feel helpless. So it's just certain things we just have to do to try to move forward. Though they're there, it's just that 
we have to find little steps at a time to make it through the grief. And the grief, you begin to heal when it doesn't hurt as much. You're able to talk, like I'm able to talk about my father or my grandfather, the things that they've done, the memories. The memories to me is a key factor because that's what we hold on to. And the fact that our loved one would want us to keep going. If our loved one died and we feel like, you know, I just don't want to live anymore or I'm really depressed, sometimes we have to seek out professional help. Because you go into this zone that I'm going to close the curtains. I don't want anyone to come over. And sometimes you may have moments like that, but you shouldn't have moments like that all the time. So I just wanted to, as I kind of wind down a little bit, I wanted to just encourage you to have self-care. Take care of yourself. What keeps me going is just my granddad kept going. You know, it's just I got to keep going. He stayed in the garden. He he drove trucks. He was the grandpa for everyone. He had this life. He kept putting up Christmas lights until his death at 84. So that's why I have to keep putting the lights up. It just brings me that memory of, okay, let's keep the Christmas lights going because I keep him alive in my heart. Be gentle with yourself. Let go of timelines. Don't allow people to say, okay, it's been two months. You should be over this by now. Or it's been six months. Don't allow people to put timelines on you because grief can last almost a lifetime. The pain just becomes lighter and lighter. And a lot of times we're harder on ourselves because we can be fine. We can go to the store. We can go in Walmart, whatever, food line, wherever. And we can just be fine. And all of a sudden, we go down an aisle and it may have your grandfather's favorite coffee or his cologne. And we call that triggers and flood of emotions. You don't know where they came from. And if you could avoid it, you would, but you can't. They're triggers. They come out of nowhere. So you have those moments. It's like, okay, I can cry. If I have to go to my car and cry, or if I just have to walk up and down the aisles and just cry. For a few minutes, I'm okay. This was a trigger, but it lets you know that you're human. Just be informed with the grief process. Know that there are many people out here helping you, such as this program. And it's a guidance of validating your feelings and even encouraging you. One of the things that we I talked about before was one of the ladies at work, and she said, Deliria. My mother-in-law has been going through this particular grief for over 30 years. And I mean, basically, she stayed in stage one. Everybody that came around her, she made them feel bad, even if it was at a funeral or a wedding or a family reunion. She would begin to just cry all the time. And you all just too happy. You, you're not with my feelings. You, you don't want me to share my feelings. And even if it was at a little graduation, it, the attention swung to her. So it got to a point where her grandchildren didn't even want to come around her because she did not want to get any help. She wanted to be the center of attention all the time. And she didn't want to move on in life, just moving through it for healing. Because when you're, you're healed, other people, they are healing as well. And it's okay to express yourself in a journal, sing a song. If you feel like screaming, scream. A support group, your pastor, anyone that's out there with you. And sometimes people they take on a new venture, a new meaning. Sometimes they start a volunteer group or they're involved in a volunteer group. I wouldn't suggest that too soon after the death. Because you do have time, you do need to have that time to heal. Um, we usually suggest maybe a year out or maybe eight or nine months. Some people like, you know, if their child was killed in a terrible car accident, they begin to start another venture of going around the schools and letting people know the effects of drunk driving. So they, they, they start a cause. 
So just stay connected, um, be around people that are with you. It is imperative to seek connection because you may feel like you want to be alone, but understand the negative side to being alone is that isolation can actually make the grief aspect harder because sometimes if you're in a house with the windows closed, with the door closed, you don't answer the phones from your children, your coworker, you're in a zone, you can become depressed. Some people go into drugs, you know, so just be careful. Sometimes a healing part is some people begin to get a dog to help them. They start a new venture. So just think about those things and know that you are not on this journey by yourself. And instead of one day at a time, it's actually one moment at a time. And know that you are not on this journey by yourself. This concludes my encouraging words for today. I will talk to you next go round. I love it, Valeria. I, there is so much wisdom in what you said. And I, on my phone, was typing some of the things that, that I really, that stood out to me. And mm -hmm. I guess because I kind of lived through some of it, the I'm right. sorry for crying. I oh. did that all the time. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. And I love the fact that like you would withhold a tissue so that the person, the person is just feeling allowed to yeah. be. Right. And then, you know, the avoiders, the advisors and the advocates, all three of those in my life. And I'm really thankful for all of them because each yeah. one of them, even though some like the avoiders and the advisors were hard to deal with, right. it, it, it grew me and it taught me things. Exactly. But I, I like what you said about the advisors because everybody has an opinion these days. This is what you need to do. This is what you need to do. Instead of letting the person kind of just walk through and, yes. and see and feel where it's leading, mm -hmm. but to give them like this, this thing to say that that's right. not what mm -hmm. I need to hear right now. So right. good. So Thank good. You. They have all the answers, but it's like, okay, I know you think you have all the answers. I know you think you can give me 20,000 verses, but mm -hmm. can you just let me be? Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And I wonder a lot of times with, with the avoiders and I went to lunch with one of those avoiders after a year. Wow. And I, I knew she had asked a few times and I'm like, no, no. And she's like, please, can we just do lunch? I'm like, okay. But I wasn't able to eat lunch with her until I brought it up. <laughs> oh, wow. I was like, I mm -hmm. want to have a lunch with you. I want to have a relationship with you, but I have to let you know that you really hurt my feelings because right. Mm -hmm. You acted like you didn't know me for months. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and exactly. then the healing begins mm -hmm. when it doesn't hurt so much. Exactly. I wanted to power through and figure it out and make it stop, but mm -hmm. you can't, you just right. can't. Mm -hmm. And just a few points at the end that you were talking about, seek out help, keep your loved one alive, let go of timelines, huge and Thank triggers you. mean you're human triggers. you. I went to the grocery store one time and lost it. First time I yes. had been back full cart. And I'm like, I got to get out of here. I got to get out of here. And then I beat myself up for being ridiculous. Wow. Yep. And, and that's what, that's what people do, you know, because it's like, it's not normal. But then right. why is it not normal for feelings to come out of nowhere? This is my loved one. Anything can trigger. Right. Right. You know? yes. That is amazing. Mm -hmm. So good girl. So good. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for being here today, for showing up. If this podcast has given you hope, encouragement, or helped you in any way, share it with a friend, either in a text or on your social platforms. Also, please subscribe, rate, and leave a written review on iTunes. It's a huge blessing for me to know that you're out there. Lastly, and this is important, you are not alone. Connect with me on the Grief to Great Day website, the link is below, and sign up for our free newsletters. I want to be able to pray for you by name. Remember, grief isn't something you're going to get over, but a great day is something you can get to.